Hi, good morning. Good morning. All right, thank you so much for coming today. Um, you know, one thing I'm just going to ask you, since we have fewer people here, people in the back wouldn't mind squeezing forward or coming forward. It would be nice to have everybody a little bit, uh, a little bit closer. So very much appreciate you all for, for coming today, uh, early in the morning, 10 o'clock. Uh, we are here to have a forum on language access in the Affordable Care Act. I'm Phil Ting, I'm the assembly member from San Francisco, represent the western part of San Francisco and northern San Mateo County. This is uh, one of the most critical issues of our time. I really want to thank the panelists, we have the panelists and experts here uh, for taking time out of their very busy schedule to, to be here. Um, starting at my uh, far right, we have uh, Annis Arthur, who is the regional manager of the Office of Civil Rights for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Annis, for, for being here. We have uh, also Terry Sanders, who's the director of policy analysis for California Pan Ethnic Health Network, or CPAN, uh, as they're called. Uh, Jonathan uh, Messinger, who is a, a doctor, a physician, is the clinics manager and cultural competence leader of the San Mateo Medical Center. And Sherry Hirota, who's the longtime executive director of Asian Health Services over at Oakland. Again, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us. Um, you know, as you know, California has one of the, some of the strongest laws in the nation on patients' rights to an interpreter. And in fact, we have, over the years, passed many laws around language access, not just in healthcare, but in very, various Sorry. facets of um, government. But unfortunately, due to budget consideration, we haven't come anywhere near fulfilling that promise. Uh, as you all know, one in five Californians speak a language other than English at home. Uh, right now, as we are in the process of rolling out uh, Obamacare all over the country, and we're very excited about rolling out Cover California, which will uh, really get started January 1st, uh, it doesn't really matter that we're removing one of the largest barriers to health care access, which is insurance. Because even if you have insurance, if you can't talk to or communicate with your physician, with your nurse, with your healthcare professionals, really that healthcare will not be a flaw. So what we want to do is make sure that we bridge that gap, that we can have access to healthcare. Uh, right now, many immigrant families, many families are bringing their children to do interpretation. And obviously, uh, right now I have a six-year-old. If I had to rely on my six-year-old to interpret for me for various health issues, or very sensitive health issues, I think that would uh, very much impact my ability to access quality health care. Conversely, if we are talking about, or I couldn't communicate with my uh, health care professionals about what's happening with my daughter, uh, that would have an impact on their ability to really serve, serve my children. So, as you know, we have millions of Californians who are going to be eligible for health care. But again, we need to be able to bridge that gap. That, that's why one of the reasons we're here to also to talk about AB 1263, which is being carried by our speaker, John Perez, uh, really which will allow uh, up to one-time cost of $1.4 million to develop program guidelines and seek necessary federal approvals to develop billing systems to really get interpreters into the healthcare system so that we can really have professionals do the job. Just like you wouldn't want a nurse or a doctor that wasn't trained to serve you, uh, provide you health care, really how could we expect anybody who's not fully culturally competent to be an interpreter or really be that bridge to our health care professionals? You know? It's critical that we get this funding because without the funding, we have absolutely no ability to hire or to bring in uh, culturally competent individuals to help us with that health care. So, Again, we, we also have a couple of personal stories we wanted to start off in the morning, uh, just to sort of set the tone and to just reiterate again, these are real people, real life situations, real issues that healthcare professionals are encountering every day. 
So I wanted to bring up uh, Juan and Lynn C2. Or Juan and Lynn C2. They can come up. I'm also going to have an interpreter. Uh, the interpreters are going to be Carissa and Romy. Are going to interpret. And they're really going to uh, talk about their personal uh, stories and illustrate uh, why it's so critical. You can come up. Yeah, why don't you come up? And then uh, we even cannot recognize my sister after the surgery because um, she is like so pain and everything turns like we cannot recognize her. That's why we try to look for the doctor and ask an interpreter for us to talk to the doctor for what she's looking right now. Finally, the doctor came to us, but no interpreter. That's why we cannot communicate with the doctor. So after an hour, uh, finally, their interpreter to us came to us. 
我哋即係我哋都屋企人都非常好擔心我哋嘅姐姐會有生命危險啦。So during the waiting time, we really, really worry about the, uh, my sister because she seems like so weak. 而且我哋誒，佢唔知道誒有咩原因誒引起㗎。And we don't know why my sister has the sinus like that, and what happens for her. So after the interpreter told us, we has we know that if um. Probably my sister will lose her life if she don't go to the surgery like 10 minutes late. That's why we really hope that uh, there's more interpreter in our community can help the family like us to um, make us more understand what happens in for our family peoples. Because San Francisco is the diverser um, people living here. So we hope that the state can hear our voice and can have more funding regarding the medical interpreter issues in our community. Especially our new um, newcomers, new immigration family. Thank you. If we could have Emila Vargas come down, Emila Vargas, and while uh, Ms. Vargas is coming up, again, this really reiterates why we need to have interpreters. I mean, for all of you who've ever had to go get surgery or who've ever had to talk about something uh, that you needed to. Uh, Something that wasn't uh, making you feel very well. Imagine if you could not communicate to your physician, or could not communicate to your nurse. I mean, how would that impact your diagnosis? How would that impact what kind of services you got? As you heard from Ms. Tito, uh, it can have very uh, dramatic uh, impacts in anybody's particular care or their life. So, uh, Ms. Vargas, thank you so much for coming today. Um, we wouldn't have read this in a little bit of a similar way to translate it, so she's going to do the testimony first because she wants to be comfortable saying and she doesn't want to use any words. So then I will do that translation afterwards. Thank you very much. Hola, mi nombre es Hermina Vargas. Soy
este intérprete y pues por eso es muy importante tener un intérprete en su idioma y pues muy importante todo eso gracias As he said it before, in January of this year, my husband Ruben went to the to have an investigative surgery on his heart doctor's medical center in San Pablo. He he has had a history of surgery failure and requires to undergo dialysis. He told the doctor in Spanish that he didn't feel well because he didn't have the dialysis dialysis treatment before. Even asking in Spanish to his doctor when he will when he will get into night dialysis again. His his doctor he didn't understand exactly what he was saying. Uh, through through that through that procedure, a failure to have a had didn't understand that he had a had you know a surgery. Uh, and that what happens was when he was in the treatment. My husband started shaking and started throwing blood through his through his mouth. He was shaking and fell into the surgery room. And two, two nurses assisted the, phys, uh, the doctor physically put it down. There were complications during the surgery, and the nurses came to my to my waiting room and say something's wrong with your husband. He could die if he doesn't go to ICU. My husband has seven years of the lot then waiting for the dialysis to have a kidney transplant. I didn't know what to do and where to go, I was saying, because I didn't understand the English part. If my daughter wasn't there, I couldn't have known what's going on. For me, having an interpreter is important because cases like my husband, people might die. Thank you. Again, what we see so often, especially in the case of Ms. Vargas, where you know she's relying, and I don't know how old her, her daughter is, but she's relying on her daughter to really provide the translation. Uh, again, if you have a daughter that's 18 years old, maybe a little bit easier. If you have a daughter like my age, who's six years old, you're not going to be able to get the level of interpretation that you really need to understand. And again, um, not, not to over-hyperbolize, but again, obviously, these particular cases, it is a case of life and death. And too often in healthcare, we, we need our professionals to be making these very critical decisions. And of course, if they don't have the information that they need to make the decision, it's very easy to make the wrong ones. So again, that's why it's so critical. Uh, that's why we're, we're here to talk about AB 1263 and the Medi-Cal expansion, because we're so proud that we are expanding Medi-Cal. We are so proud that we're going to have more people, millions more people in the healthcare system. But with those millions of more people entering the system, how do we ensure that they get the access that they need to the healthcare providers? So again, access isn't only insurance. Access isn't only just being able to get to the professionals. Access is being able to communicate with them. So without that bridge, so often what we're seeing is that um, everything else sort of doesn't really matter. So, um, if we could start with the panelists, I was hoping to start with you, Sherry. Um, Sherry, you've uh, worked for over 30 years uh, working with underserved communities, immigrant communities. Um, really, how well the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, allow communities um, that Asian health services services to access health care? And really, what could be done to make sure that we have more interpreters uh, be part of this process? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'd like to really thank someone and team for organizing this forum on language access. It's something that I've been working on at Asian Health Services for over the 38 years that I've been uh, at the clinic. Asian Health Services' mission is to provide quality and accessible health care to those who, because of language and affordability, can't go elsewhere. So. 38 years later, we are serving 28,000 patients annually. But even with that, we have 5,000 people on a waiting list trying to get into the clinic. 
And I think that's evidence of the need for more language access in culturally competent providers. Um, we have services in Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Korean, Cambodian, Tagalog, Mien, Mongolian, Korean, and Burmese, and English. And the list gets longer every year. But for all those 38 years, we hear stories that we, like we've heard this morning, every, every month, every week. And really, it is a question of language access being one of the largest barriers, second to affordability to get into care. So here you have the Affordable Care Act. It's an unprecedented opportunity to provide access to those who have not had it before. Medi-Cal eligibility will go up to $2,610 a month for a family of four, where it's currently about $1,900 a month. The new exchange will provide an unprecedented amount of potential subsidies so that an individual making $1,400 a month could end up getting a health plan that normally costs $318, they could get it for $18 a month. So with that great victory in covering more than 60% of the people that are currently uninsured, the question is, what is the opportunity for us to also make sure that language access doesn't remain a barrier? I was on an 18-month uh, committee in Washington, D.C., appointed by Secretary of Health Sibelius, and this was looking at redefining medically uninsured areas and populations. And with the studies that we looked at, we were able to determine that while insurance status was the largest risk factor in utilizing health care, um, that language barriers was documented as the second largest risk factor in getting into care. So I actually, uh, for those of you who are interested in the heavy analysis, I do have a two-page brief on this, um, on this study. So what does that mean for us then? I mean, we're going to ensure more people, but we need that language access. Population-based and multilingual, culturally competent care plays a significant role in providing access, quality of care, and models of systems change. This will substantially impact how well we're able to impact positive health outcomes and create cost savings in the system. So as we embark upon 2014 and healthcare reform, I would have to say that as healthcare reform, positive and negative, gets measured, I guarantee you that patient satisfaction, control of chronic disease, emergency room use, outreach and enrollment, will all be impacted very heavily by the, how well we address linguistic appropriate services. So I'd really like to thank and, and support the, um, the AD 1263 and, and a number of other recommendations that would include more uh, population-based uh, language accessible health centers throughout the country, uh, reimbursement for language uh, access on all levels, uh, the outpatient care and, and hospitalization. Um, enforcement of that standards, uh, which I'm sure any will talk about. Um, and for us to really get out in our communities and share the information about the opportunities in healthcare reform in the languages that people need to hear. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sherry. Um, also, we all are going to be taking questions at the end. We have index cards that if people are interested in uh, writing questions, feel free to take an index card, we'll pass them out, and just hand them back in, and we'll be taking all those questions at the end. Um, Dr. Messinger, uh, maybe you could talk about what, what sort of uh, ACA means for you, and also how this impacts your ability to serve the populations you're trying to serve uh, in a very diverse county like San Mateo. Sure, thank you very much, Simon. So, uh, California, as you may know, has uh, one of the most diverse populations in the United States. There are over 214 languages spoken in California. How do we address this problem? If somebody comes to our hospital who, you know, doesn't, who speaks a language that nobody who's working there can speak, how can we possibly take care of that person? And we've been addressing this problem for about eight years. I want to make it clear that with ACA, we're going to be seeing more people, but the diversity won't increase. We, see, we will still see the same kinds of people that we see now, the same people with the same ethnicities and cultures 
and language is going to be seen more. So we have to have a system that will address the needs of all of these people. I also want to make it clear that interpretation is not something that just serves the patient. Interpretation is something that serves the provider. Doctors who work in our system, which is a public health system, work there because they really, really love their patients and want to take care of them. And they know that the quality of their care depends on direct communication with the patient. If the patient can't explain what's happening for them, can't explain how they're feeling, and can't understand what the doctor says about medications and diagnoses, then there's a problem. If the doctor can't understand what the patient is saying, and the doctor is trying to ensure that the patient is safe, and if the patient doesn't understand the medication instructions, we have a big problem, and we've had many problems. So, for both the provider and the patient, we had to come up with a solution. For the past eight years, we've been part of something called the Healthcare Interpreter Network. So, normally people think when they go to a public hospital, they're getting second-rate care. And this is not the case. The public hospital is at the forefront of providing care to people of multiple ethnicities and people who don't speak English. We're, we're at the forefront. And I want to explain what we do. So, we have about 22 hospitals now that are part of our network. It doesn't include San Francisco, Alameda, and, and uh, Santa Clara because they have their own systems. But all the other public hospitals in the state are part of our network, including Los Angeles County. Every one of those hospitals provides interpreters to the network. How does the doctor or the patient access this network? The network is a completely computerized video and voice remote interpreter system. So we don't use in-person interpreters. We don't depend on having someone available, someone who might take an hour to get there to interpret, somebody who might not even be in the building. We can provide an interpreter in about 24 languages within 30 seconds, and in 172 languages by voice within about a minute. So think about it, nobody's waiting, the doctor's not waiting, the patient's not waiting, and the interpreter's not waiting. It's instantaneous. How do we do this? It's a completely computerized routing system. The computer looks for the interpreter. It's not a perfect system, and sometimes the equipment fails, but the idea is a really good one. So if somebody who speaks Armenian walks through the door of our hospital, we know that within 30 seconds, we can have an interpreter from Los Angeles who speaks Armenian on the video screen. This makes the patient feel more comfortable, well taken care of, and understood. Some patients prefer to have an in-person interpreter. We try to convince them that this works just as well. We let them experience it. They may have their uncle or their aunt or a neighbor with them. We try to not use those people as interpreters for HIPAA reasons, for uh, privacy reasons. But once the person experiences our interpreter network, they're usually fine with it. And we say, you know, it's not just for you, your doctor needs an interpreter too. Uh, so our physicians who use the system are very, not only happy with it, but very proud of it because it was the first of its kind in the world. There are others now, but eight years ago this was the only system. We work with our health plan of San Mateo, which is a Medi-Cal managed care program. With ACA, we're not really sure whether the federal uh, state funding for interpreter services will still be available in the way it is now. But our health plan is able to pay for uh, this, these services, not just for Medi-Cal or Medicare patients, but for any patient who is served by any product they provide, and the Health Plan of San Mateo manages all of our programs, even our county programs, and they've been very generous, so that if it's a Health Plan member, somebody who's getting uh, their care with the product of the Health Plan, we have a way of diverting the call to the Health Plan's billing rather than to ours. So the Health Plan pays for those calls, 
that are for their members, and we pay for calls that are for people who are not health plan members. And they're primarily using Medi-Cal funding to do that, and we're hoping that that funding stays in place. Uh, one of my biggest concerns, of course, as a clinic manager, is that about a third of my patients are not documented. And these people will not be benefiting from the ACA, and we have to find a way to continue to serve them, because we're the public hospital, we're the safety net, and continue to serve them in the languages that they speak. And we're very proud of our system and hope that we can continue doing that and that other hospitals will join us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Karen, maybe you can talk about um, more, more organizations really being on the cutting edge of advocating for a lot of these uh, policy changes. Maybe you can talk about sort of what policy changes uh, you've been fighting for this last year, uh, but also what you see in the future coming down the pipeline. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'm Kara Sanders. I work with the California Pan and the Health Network, and we are a statewide multicultural health advocacy organization uh, dedicated to eliminating health disparities. And one of the ways that we do that is by focusing on cultural and linguistic access to healthcare services. So um, I know um, Edis is going to talk about some of the federal um, laws, but just a little background. Um, title, you know, it all sort of starts with Title VI, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is a federal law which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin, which includes limited English proficient. Um, and what that means is that all entities that receive federal funding have to um, provide language services, oral interpretation in any language. California has a similar lookalike law um, that, you know, all applies to state programs and state agencies. Um, but we know that this is hard to enforce, as we heard from some of the stories this morning. Um, there, are there are examples where um, you know, people could use oral interpretation and it's not always available. Um, excuse me, under the ACA, we know that over a third of the newly eligible in Medi-Cal and in Covered California will, be, will speak English less than very well. Uh, they're limited English proficient. And so, it has a huge implication for how the state uh, will provide services to, these pop to this population moving forward. Unfortunately, um, in Medi-Cal, the Medi-Cal managed care contract provisions and policy letters um, actually require uh, Medi-Cal managed care plans to provide 24-hour uh, um, free interpretation at all points of services for their clients. Um, to translate key materials into threshold languages. And currently in California, that, that includes about 13 languages. But there are a lot of languages that are not a part of, uh, of, of that in terms of materials. Um, and it also requires um, plans to assess linguistic capabilities of interpreters and bilingual providers, excuse me, and to conduct a group needs assessment to figure out uh, what types of services they need to provide moving forward. Um, but there's still much more we can do in California. And as we look at the Medi-Cal program, there are several bills that are moving right now in the state legislature, um, but I'll mention just a few of them. Uh, AB 411, which is actually a bill that um, CPEN is sponsoring this year, requires an analysis of quality data by race, ethnicity, and language preference um, through the Department of Healthcare Services for Medi-Cal managed care plans. And having this data will be so important in terms of figuring out what the need will look like and understanding what some of the um, issues that and disparities uh, communities of color, limited English proficient, will face uh, under you know, post ACA. Um, three other bills I want to mention: um, AB 505, which is uh, uh, by some member Nazarian, will codify the Medi-Cal managed care language access requirements. So. If, ensure that um, language access is provided and materials translated into um, all materials into the Medi-Cal threshold languages. Um, SB 204 is a bill that will require translated prescription drug labels. And finally, AB 1263 by um, Speaker Perez, a very important bill um, that will create a, um, uh, establishes a medical interpreter reimbursement system where California can join um, 13 other states uh, in drawing down federal funding to help pay for interpreter services. Um, the bill creates a program called the Community Cal Program 
It includes a more robust certification process for um, interpreters through DHCS, as well as an advisory committee to help advise DHCS on implementation of the program. Um, we think that you know these are really important um, uh, provisions that are moving right now in Sacramento. Um, we know that um, AB 1263 is actually um, in appropriations right now. Um, we'll be headed to the floor and eventually, um, hopefully, to the governor's desk for our signature. Um, and we do, you know, urge um, folks to support that bill. So. Thank, thank you so much, Karen. Um, Director Annis or Deputy Director Annis. Um, perhaps you could, uh, I know that the federal civil rights laws is really what you're charged with enforcing. So maybe you could talk about sort of what, what civil rights laws are, um, you've been focused on enforcement, but also given the huge expansion of healthcare, what your major concerns are, are really how we bring this population into the system where they have been in the system before, but how do you ensure that they get the access to care that they deserve? Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Ting, for asking our office to participate. I'm with the Office for Civil Rights, which is the part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, a federal agency. This is, um, San Francisco is the headquarters for Region 9. And Region 9 covers California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Trust Territories. Our office, as Carrie said, our office enforces uh, discrimination laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, disability, and age. We have jurisdiction over entities that receive federal financial assistance from our department, and such uh, organizations include hospitals, nursing homes, social service agencies, mental health clinics, uh, programs for youth and families. Some different types of federal financial assistance includes Medicare, um, loans, grants, and Medicaid in um, California, uh, the Medi-Cal program. In order to receive federal money from our department, an entity has to take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to all of its programs, activities, and services to people that are limited English proficient. These reasonable steps can, of course, include oral and written interpretation. Something I wanted to highlight a couple of things that are new in our office. Uh, recently, our office has issued a request for information on Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, age, disability, and sex under any program health program receiving federal money or any entity that is either covered or administered or established by the Affordable Care Act. This request for information, you can log on to our website. We are soliciting comments, suggestions, best practices for from health care providers, health consumers, health care insurers, anybody on best practices of how to act. Uh, provide language access and to better provide services to people that are limited English proficient. This year, our office launched a national compliance review initiative called Advancing Effective Communication in Critical Access Hospitals. What we did was review the provision of language access to uh, people that are limited English proficient in small areas small rural areas, hospitals that had less than 25 beds or more than 35 miles from the nearest uh, trauma center. And this was an attempt to find out how smaller facilities, we all, we live in San Francisco, but we wanted to find out how smaller facilities are reaching people that need language access in smaller communities. With regard to language access for the Affordable Care Act, uh, the main website, www.healthcare.gov, is in English and in Spanish, and is accessible to persons with visual impairments. And the national consumer customer service number is op operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is, they have operators in English and in Spanish, and access to a language line with more than 150 languages. 
our office is we do investigate discrimination complaints if there is a situation where you feel like that uh, a law has been violated or you've been denied an interpreter and you would like to file a complaint with our office, we do that. And we are also available to assist entities and organizations in providing technical assistance and giving you resources on something that information that Dr. Messenger said about sharing resources and providing better language access to people with limited English proficiency. Before I forget, our website is www.hhs.gov forward slash OCR. We have a great deal of information on the website. There's uh, resources that you can use, and uh, we urge you to comment on Section 1557. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so just to get to the, to the questions for a quick second, um, this is to, to Sherry and Dr. Uh, you know, people talk about how difficult it is to provide language access services. But yet, you, both your organizations seem to have been able to do it. How, how are you able to do it while others aren't? Well, that's a good question, standards. But there was no money that was really attached to those standards. And we were promised that once they got the managed care in the way, that, um, you know, that they would be looking at resources of that health plans would try to incorporate. Some of you have. I talked to one of the more progressive health plans, the Alameda Alliance. They used to use a um, administrative cap that they were allowed when man managed care first started, and they allowed us to provide some interpretation uh, reimbursement under that cap. That cap no longer exists, and so <laughs> as a result, there is no um, resource that's earmarked for this. Asian Health Services, on the other hand, gets a special rate of reimbursement because we're a federally qualified health center. That means we get more than a different provider, but it incorporates enabling services. So the, the interpreters or the bilingual costs, that is not going to be applied to the health exchange. So there's going to be a loss in the amount of financial support for health centers like Asian Health Services to provide that care. So I say that so those are two really key areas um, that I think your bill, or the bill that you're supporting and talking about today would really bring some actual resources to enable us to expand that level of access. And Chair, just, uh, can you tell me roughly what percentage of your clients don't speak English? About 91% of our clients do not speak English as their uh, first language, and so they require an interpreter or a bilingual staff to get um, their care. For us, it's a little bit different because we don't have the specific mission that you do. So about 40% of our patients have limited English proficiency. Uh, for us, the mission of our medical center is to take care of everybody that comes through our door and provide them with quality care, not just take care of them, but really provide them with equal care no matter who they are and what language they speak. That's a very difficult mission when it comes to language access. About eight years ago, our leadership committed themselves to this because they knew it was something we had to do. And right now, we spend about half a million dollars a year, unreimbursable dollars, on this. And, uh, you know, that took leadership. The people who are in charge of that money have to decide that they're going to make this investment without any hope of a reimbursement. Well, I think one thing difference between you and any other uh, health place is you, you don't turn people away. Right. People, whoever comes to the door, you're serving. That's our mission. Yeah. So, um, to, to Deputy Director Arthur, to, to Terry, um, you know, what, what do you see, you know, you have these two organizations that have shown that they can do it, and yet there's quite a number of other organizations that still are probably lagging. Um, and, you know, how, so how do you bring people along. What, what do we need to do to keep pushing everybody so that they can really have a much more culturally competent model throughout, throughout the state? I'll just say um, a couple things and turn it over a bit. I think it's, you know, people have already touched on this. Um, Sherry just touched on it. It's, it's a combination of enforcement and resources. Um, 
you know, we have great language access laws in California and federally too, but, um, you know, how often is, I can, you can imagine that there are lapses, people are not able to get informal interpretation services, and part of it is because they don't, they're not aware that they have a right to request oral interpretation services. Um, you know, the hospitals are supposed to notify people that that, that, that right exists so that people will take advantage of it. Um, but even so, you know, sometimes people don't, aren't aware, and I think that is such a huge issue. Um, all the unreported instances that, you know. First question is from uh, Nora. Uh, Nora's question is, how can doctors be enlightened about the first need for interpretation? Two, how to work well with an interpreter? And three, the importance of cultural respect as well as language access. Uh, Nora also wanted me to give a plug about City College, the primary trainer of interpreters, uh, that they're open and accredited and need enrollment to stay open. So anybody who's interested in being an interpreter, they look at City College. But uh, let's tackle Nora's question. 